Good afternoon. Glad to be here. Glad to see all the faces that are coming out for uh, Developer Day. This talk is about um, advanced gadget and UI development using the Google Ajax APIs. Hopefully everyone here is signed up for this and uh, has an understanding of JavaScript and HTML and DOM. Um, don't necessarily need to know about the Ajax APIs. Hopefully after this talk you will and know a lot more about them and want to use them. Um, so let's get started. So the agenda for the talk is uh, we're going to talk about the application concept. Um, the talk actually came about um, regarding a you know, an application concept that I was asked to build internally at Google using the Ajax APIs. The problem is a real one. Uh, the application is real that you'll see. You might not ever see it in the wild in its current incarnation, um, but it was a real problem we were trying to solve. And we got to use our own technologies to do it. Um, and out of that effort actually came the talk. And this talk was given at Google I.O. in San Francisco. And now I get to give it for you guys. Uh, we'll talk about the basic building blocks, what we actually used to build the application. It's not only the Ajax APIs. Other Google technologies are used, and we'll talk about those. We'll go into the background of the Ajax APIs, why they exist. And then we'll talk specifically about the three main components. their search, feeds, and language APIs. And the goals of the talk is to give you guys an understanding of how you would actually go about building an application like this, turning it into an iGoogle gadget, which we'll do at the end. This one's very simple. We kind of just wrap it up. But it is a, a step that we'll go through, and you'll see how that works. Understand the Ajax APIs at both a low level and a conceptual level, and then realize how they're actually utilized in building this application. We are going to talk about some of the more advanced features of the APIs and use some of the raw, low-level uh, technologies involved. So the application concept. And again, this is real. So corporate actually came to the team that I work as part of and said, we've got over 120, I believe, blogs that showcase Google content and are officially sanctioned by Google. And we need a way to showcase the information that's going through all these blogs. What can we do to enable that? So we brainstormed. We sat around in a room. And we came up with the idea of potentially providing a tag cloud view, um, you know, tag uh, specific blogs. So all the blogs that are specific to YouTube or mobile, like Android or developer or advertisers could have tags associated with them. We could provide a tag cloud view that actually kind of gave you a, an instant snapshot into what is new and exciting in terms of all the blogs in aggregate. Um, we also want a hierarchical view of all the blogs. So by tag, um, you can actually dive down and see uh, the actual blogs themselves. We wanted you to be able to search uh, across all the blogs. And that makes obviously a lot of sense since we're Google. And that's a good thing for us. Um, but it actually presented some interesting uh, challenges and trade-offs that we'll talk about and how we actually went about solving that problem. Um, provide language translation where applicable. Language translation and detection is the, one of our newest APIs, yet it's the quickest growing that we've ever uh, launched. Um, a lot of times, we actually have low, low APIs and then rich controls on top that drive adoption. Uh, this one doesn't have any rich controls yet, and it's uh, doing a lot of traffic already. And we'll talk about that one a lot today here. And then deploy as an iGoogle gadget. So the basic building blocks, whether you like them or hate them, they are what they are. And it's the HTML and DOM, uh, CSS. Again, we're building a web-based application. JavaScript, the tools that I use, and I'll kind of give a little bit of an insight into at least the way I went about approaching the problem. Um, everyone does it differently, uh, but I'll give you a little insight into what I thought was important in terms of uh, being able to build the application. We'll obviously talk about the Ajax APIs, uh, both in terms of a conceptual and introductory level, but then quickly dive into exactly what we uh, use within the application itself for both search, feeds, and of course, the language API. And then we're going to talk about 
um, Google Reader and Google Custom Search Engines and how they played a role in building out uh, the application. And then again, wrapping up with iGoogle. About two and a half years ago, uh, one of the team members that I work with, Mark Lakofsky, um, challenged me to learn JavaScript. And I told him absolutely not until it had a real debugger built for it. And he laughed and he said, real programmers don't need debuggers. Go ahead and learn it anyway. And I refused until Firebug came along. Hopefully everyone in this room knows what Firebug is. Um, if you don't, please go and find out. It's an indispensable tool to build these types of applications. Uh, it runs inside of Firefox, um, but I think uh, that limitation is gonna be quickly uh, gone. Um, it's an incredible piece of software and it really enables uh, these type of applications which can be cumbersome because you're dealing with so many different technologies between the HTML and DOM, CSS and JavaScript. Uh, makes it a lot easier. So, as an introduction to the Ajax APIs, what are they? Why do we do them? Why did Mark and I and Vadim decide to do these things? Um, we really wanted to deliver the web into a web page, into a application framework without necessarily requiring server components. We wanted to open up Google's technologies and do this in the simplest way possible. We originally launched with search and everything that search entails in terms of news and local and video, which is YouTube, um, blogs. Um, we came along next with feeds about a year and a half ago. And on the surface, feeds doesn't look like it's that uh, impressive. Hopefully I'll change your mind with this talk about what the value proposition is that we're trying to offer. And uh, the latest one we did was, again, language, translation. So how are these actually, these APIs built? Um, like a lot of services at Google, we run a worldwide global network of servers that listen to requests in a RESTful manner for JSON and JSONP results. So we do have a RESTful data access layer to all of this. And it's actually documented now. So for example, if you actually wanted to access all of these services but necessarily didn't want to do it, with our JavaScript libraries, you can do that. What that RESTful data actually generates and gives back to you is JSON. JSON is JavaScript notation, object notation, and uh, the packaged version of that, which allows us to springboard back into our JavaScript runtime. The JavaScript runtime is a very thin, low layer um, on top of the RESTful data responses. It's designed for ease of use. We then put a lot of controls and UI elements on top of these. Um, one thing, if it's not clear, is uh, all of these are free. Um, all of the UI controls come with source code. Um, a lot of the solutions, especially that I built, I know people take and rip apart and make a lot better than I could have done. Um, but the purpose of what we were trying to do is adoption. We wanted people to use it. We want people to tell us what they like, what they don't like. And we think we're really good at responding pretty quickly. Everything we build, we assume that we are building it in the best way we can in terms of the UI, um, but we assume that everyone wants, everyone wants to do their own thing. And so we will package these things with default styling, but you can override that. And this demo actually shows that also, so we'll talk about that. Again, in terms of just some of the background, it's, a, it's access to Google systems. Started with search, we've got feeds and language now. Um, it's probably a good assumption there's more coming down the pipe. We've had an overwhelming response to these APIs. Um, they're very, very fast. Uh, they're globally available. People like them. Uh, the UI uh, controls are also well uh, liked because they can be styled and integrated. So a lot of big time publishers, and you'll see some examples of this in the next slide or two, um, have actually adopted this code because their designers can style them any way they want and have them blend into the page. Lots of different um, use cases. Pro developers, scripters, um, long tail, short tail, all over the map. Lots and lots of usage. So in terms of the search API, the search API actually encompasses 
all of the searchers that we actually listed up here on the slide. Um, it started with our mainstay, web. Um, and web actually gets a good amount of traffic, but it's actually one of the lowest um, traffic-wise APIs that we have. Um, video and news are the two poster children for the Ajax search API. Um, they're embedded on literally hundreds of thousands of sites. And again, because they can blend in, a lot of times you don't even know they're there. We have image local, which ties into maps. The actual maps API actually has a control built into it that uses our local search. Um, so it's a good example of Google eating their own dog food. Uh, the maps team and the Ajax IT API teams work very, very closely together. We have book search and blog search. And blog search is an interesting one because you would immediately think that for the application, since we're talking about blogs, that's what we would have used. And there's an interesting decision trade-off that we made there that we'll talk about. Next is the feed API. And on the slide, you can see some of the higher level UI controls that we've built. Um, the one at the top right is for people.com. Um, which is very popular in the States. It's one of my favorite, actually. Um, I actually built that one, uh, and that's an iGoogle gadget that's deployed, and people actually promote that. The one on the bottom right is a slideshow uh, that I built uh, that's very, very flexible, has call-outs, can be styled, and is a really well-adopted uh, control for a lot of the things that are, uh, a lot of the solutions that we see outside, and the dynamic uh, feed control. Why the feed API? A lot of people, when we first brought this out, said, I don't understand. I can get a feed myself. Um, but a lot of times, even if you want a well-behaved feed, you need a server component. And if you remember back to the beginning of the talk, uh, one of the things we were trying to achieve is very, very ease of use without necessarily a server component. Anyone who's played with feeds also knows that uh, syntactically they're XML, but semantically they're all over the place. Um, the two major contenders these days are RSS and Atom. Um, but if you want to develop a piece of code, let's say for this slideshow, um, or let's say the thing up top, and you don't necessarily know what your data source is coming from, you don't know if it's RSS or if it's Atom or if it's RSS.9 versus 2.0, things like that. So what Google does is we actually normalize all that for you. We fetch all the pages and all the feeds, we normalize it down, and we deliver that to you as JSON. The load call up there is actually the ability to load a feed up. And obviously JSON is not the complete picture here because we can only normalize so much. And we came up with a pretty interesting uh, solution to that problem. I'll talk about that on the slide uh, a couple from now when we actually talk specifically about what if I need additional data that's in the XML feed. Find and lookup are two uh, convenience methods. Um, find just says look up all the feeds associated with a query term similar to web search. So on uh, google.com, you might type in Ferrari, and it'll give you all mixed results and things like that. Find, in this case, will actually give you all the feeds associated with Ferrari. Besides XML, the interesting thing uh, that's not so interesting a lot of times with feeds themselves is that the URLs for the feeds are very, very strange, very long, hard to discover. Um, but you might know very simple feeds, like dig.com or in my case, NewYorkTimes.com, things like that. The last um, function there, lookup, actually allows you to give the simplified user visible web page and tell it to return the associated feed with it. So again, in certain instances, very, very helpful. One of the ones that actually um, a lot of developers um, that use Yahoo's Flickr use lookup because Flickr uses the username in the user visible web page. However, when you want the feed, it actually uses the user ID. There's no way to figure out the correlation between those two. So actually in this slideshow, uh, I actually use that code sometimes. So if I know the Flickr page's username, I can actually then get the feed using that lookup call. The language API, very, very simple. It does two things. It can detect the language, and it can translate the language. Machine translation has come a long way. It's not perfect. Um, Google thinks we have the best, um, but we know it can get better. But what we're doing very, very well is adjusting the system to get feedback and learn as it goes. Again, this uh, API we launched probably only about two months ago. Um, and it, in terms of its first month of growth, has outpaced um, everything, including uh, the Maps API for adoption. So 
obviously there's a need there for people to be able to get at content and translate it into their language. So here's the prototype. This is kind of a mock. The actual real application is running, and we're going to see it, and we're going to walk through and, and how it was built. But essentially, you see the initial page. It has the tag, and it has kind of the entry views down below. It has a search box. Um, it has a tab up there called blogs. That's actually representative of the hierarchical view that we talked about. And again, we'll go into detail about this. This was an early mock, which didn't have the translation stuff because I hadn't released it yet. Um, now that it's released, though, the real demo actually has it in there. We'll talk about that a lot. So we'll go and actually take a quick look at it running. So this is running under Firefox. Um, it goes and runs. You can load all kinds of feeds. If it finds anything um, right now that it thinks is not English, which right now the browser is set to English, um, I'm going to show you how we can actually flip it to Japanese and the application without touching it will actually adapt and only put the T's next to anything that's not Japanese. Um, it puts that T up there and the T actually says, hey, I realize that this language is not your current language. And again, it's not built into the application as a constant. It's dynamically discovered on the fly. And only the entries that actually can be translated have a little T next to them. The T is my fault. I'm not a very good UI person. Uh, I just put it together in a little tool and stuck it out there. Um, Google Corporate had a fun laughing day at it, but for the purposes of this demo, it works OK. Um, and so I can actually go ahead and click on that. And I'll go ahead and translate that into whatever language it was in, into English, um, as best it can. Again, machine translation is not perfect. I can then click on it, and it puts it back to the original one. We've kind of got this blogs view up here, which is a hierarchical view. So as you notice, I can load an individual blog, as well as the tag that it belongs to. We've got YouTube, and we've got search, and publishers, and analytics, and all kinds of fun stuff. We'll keep going back and forth between uh, the two. So what do we see? We saw the tag cloud view, the detail entry snippet view. That was the bottom part where you actually could read the text, the title, and the snippet. The hierarchical blog view, the search control and the results, and we'll talk about that. Uh, and then again, the translation capabilities. So how do we build it? The building blocks. When we originally started talking about tags and the search, we immediately went down the path of saying, OK, what can we do for the tags? In Google Reader, um, which is a feed aggregation and reading application built by Google, actually does all the heavy lifting for us. And corporate, who had already come to me and said, hey, we want to build this thing, already had an account on Google Reader where they already had the tags set up and were starting to add the blogs into these tags. And I'll explain why that became very easy for us to actually take advantage of that. Custom search engine. Remember, I kept talking about blog search and how we had an issue there. Um, and the issue isn't with blog search. Blog search works great. We have 120 blogs. And it's designing a web application. Um, how we actually went about that was we actually looked at custom, custom search engine and Google's custom search engine to actually make that a single call versus 120 calls. The APIs, and we'll talk individually about each one of those, feed, search, and language, how we actually utilize those. How do you get started? A lot of times when people say, oh, there's this complicated app and you have to do X, Y, and Z, a lot of times they actually skip the very first part. Um, I don't. So I'm going to tell you exactly the first lines of code that I wrote. We'll talk about the common loader. Uh, the common loader is Google's uh, attempt at trying to unify some of these libraries and stuff, especially the ones that Google is actually producing. So instead of having all these script sources, you could actually call Google.load. Um, just recently announced at uh, Google I.O. in San Francisco, we extended that to um, very popular third-party frameworks like Dojo and jQuery now. And so these can actually be loaded through our common loader as well. How do we put all this together? And again, wrapping this up as an iGoogle gadget. The only thing with iGoogle that we started with um, was the dimensions. So we approximated what the dimensions we wanted to utilize, knowing that we were going to make it a Google gadget. But I don't touch Google, iGoogle at all until the very end. 
Um, and I would actually recommend, depending on the complexity of what you're trying to build, you take a similar approach. Build it all within the browser, using Firebug, using everything. Get everything the way you want to. And then I'll talk about how the steps that I use to, to wrap it up. Google Reader. How do we utilize it? Again, I was telling it, it does subscription management and tags. It allows you to easily manage tags and put blogs under multiple tags. Um, but the heavy lifting that I talked about is Reader automatically generates tag-based pages. So you can actually go to a URL that actually will show you the aggregate, uh, the aggregate of all the blogs that are underneath a certain tag. That's half the story. What Reader does for us in terms of this application is they also give you a feed base page, and that's what we needed. This is a snapshot of Reader, and this is actually the account that I was saying the, the uh, a person from Google corporate actually came and said, oh, she's been working on this. And so you kind of see on the right there's official Google blogs, and it has all of the Google blogs, and there's tags that essentially map directly to that tag cloud view, so YouTube, mobile developer, um, things like that. And under management, what gets interesting here is that as you go into the management, and here's all these tags listed out that she set up. You'll see, let's, we'll pick ads verticals just as uh, the example. Once you actually click on the public link, there's a public URL generated that is this page that says every single blog underneath of ads vertical, aggregated by time, delivered to this page. You can get to it through that public page link. And so that actually looks kind of like this. And that's kind of interesting. But what's more interesting is if you're in a browser that supports it, you'll see immediately that a feed icon shows up, which means that readers also generated the feed URL that generates a lot of goop like this, but that's very interesting for the application. Custom search engine. Again, what was the problem? Well, with web applications, when you go to try to optimize them and try to figure out what makes them run well and not well, a lot of times you look at how many requests the web app is making to the back end. Blog search and web search um, are built such that when you actually do a query, you actually go to our back ends and ask uh, our servers you know, what the answer is, and they come back with it. Web search allows you to do site restrictions, and you can do several of those, but you can't really do 120 of them. And blog search doesn't actually allow you to do multiple blogs right now. So if we actually want to utilize blog search within this application, as soon as I typed in the first query term, it would have to do 120 requests to the back end and put those all together. And it just doesn't make sense. So you, you, know, you pick the right tool for the job, and in this case, it's custom search engine. You can actually build your own search engine around any parameters that you want. And it integrates directly with Ajax Web Search. So instead of site restriction in terms of a URL, you can actually pass in a custom search engine ID that's generated by this application for you. And that's the path that, that we took. So you can go in. There's lots of options. The, one, the only one we cared about was we just kept listing the blog URLs and sites to search. And corporate maintains this. And so the app never has to change when YouTube, let's say, launches a new blog. Corporate goes in and, and goes into Reader and goes into CSC, does the management, and the app stays the same. So now we've got kind of the conceptual building blocks of how we're actually going to get to the feeds for tags, how we're going to do search in terms of at least use it, using custom search engine and the CSC ID. You have an overall view of what kind of the feed, search, and language APIs do. Now, how is this application actually going to utilize them? So the feed API is going to utilize those Google Reader pages that it generates that we've made public to pull feeds in. So when I click on YouTube versus I click on a specific YouTube blog, the code underneath the covers is doing the exact same thing. It's just telling the Ajax feed API, load this feed for me. It just happens that Reader allows us to have the label ones also. It's going to use mixed format. Now, this is the part where I was talking about the feed API and us normalizing everything. So title and author and snippet 
are normalized across all different types of feeds. But what if something was in the original feed that we don't normalize? And we knew that was going to be an issue. And we tried to figure out a way to give the developer access to that data the best way we knew how without kind of saying it's an all or nothing. So we didn't want the developer to have to jump totally back into XML land. We actually like JSON. We think it's fairly easy, right? It's very lightweight, scriptable, um, very, you know, no static typing, things like that. So what we do is you can actually request the feed and say, give it to me in mixed mode. And what you get back is the JSON structure just as the normal feed where you can say, oh, I have a list of entries, and an entry has a title, and it has a snippet, and it has a date. But mixed mode, it actually has an XML mode attached to every single entry. So you can walk through the entries in JSON. You can use the iteration structure in JavaScript. And then when you need to dip down, you can actually use this XML mode, dip a little bit into the XML world, which is, at least for me, not very fun. Um, get what you need done, get back. A lot of people will actually do this as a pre-processing step so that the main flow of their code is all JavaScript. So the pre-processing step, they'll actually run through, go into the XML node, pull out what they need, then assign it to a random JSON property of the entry, which in JavaScript is totally legal. Search API, again, we talked about this in terms of blog or web search. We went with web search and we used a custom search engine. And then the language API. Um, detecting uh, the languages that aren't in my current locale for the browser, and then translating. A lot of people ask me, um, well, why don't you just auto-translate? And again, machine translation isn't perfect, but it's a great tool for what it's trying to solve, and it's always getting better. But if we inject that little icon that uh, the Google UI people laugh at me for, it gives the user the indication that something can be done with this entry. You can translate this but that it's a machine that's doing it. You actually are taking an action. So anyone who's developed web apps knows this piece, which is always fun. This is the piece I always start with. Um, I simply lay out the base structure of the page. Um, I always put classes on everything, even if there's no definitions for them. Um, this essentially is about the first rev that I did of the whole thing. Obviously, when you render it without any CSS and the browser looks awful, um, but with Firebug, which allows you to edit CSS inside the browser, you can just keep twiddling with stuff. Um, you can actually get to where you need to be very quickly, which is, again, a, a big proponent for that. So to get from the base structure to this, where I had the styling and I had some of the images that they wanted me to use and stuff like that, uh, actually only took about 15 minutes. Uh, and again, if I had to keep jumping out into an editor and doing some stuff and going into the browser hitting refresh and going back and forth, um, I probably wouldn't uh, have done it. So. so we've got placeholders for the tabs. We've got the tab view, um, which holds the tags and the hierarchical view and the search results. The detail view, which is actually the entries that we're looking at. And then a, kind of a placeholder for the search control. Uh, the search control does a lot of heavy lifting for us, although we break apart the pieces. Uh, and do some customized stuff with it. So how do you bootstrap one of these applications? So we've got, you know, we're, we're here, and I've been in Firebug, and I did all the CSS. Now I actually have to make it move. I have to make the application do something. Um, we noticed a lot of times, even building our own applications, we had a lot of script source equals, script source equals, script source equals. And so we wanted to figure out a better way to do that. Um, we weren't the first to think of this. Um, we won't be the last. Um, but it works well for us. And so the only script source you have to do um, to utilize all the Ajax APIs and most of the popular third-party frameworks today now is load up JS API. And it loads, bootstraps the common loader underneath the covers, does some other things. They're all dynamic. Um, JS API is served usually within 10, 15 milliseconds max. Uh, very, very fast. Uh, fairly small, um, can't be cached because it always changes. It has some pretty good intelligence about how to map things out underneath the covers. But once you've done that, now you're in the common loader land, if you want to be, um, which means you can do things like Google.load feeds version one, load search version one, load language version one. And there's some advanced options to those, and I would encourage you guys to read the common uh, loader documentation, but for the purpose of my example, all I want to know is when you've got all of these queued up and ready to go, just call me back. 
And so I can put in a callback there. And that plays nicely with a lot of the frameworks also. So we do the right thing. Um, we can actually even do some tricks around the DOM ready callback. So if your DOM would be ready, but you've got a couple assets, let's say large, large images, uh, we actually understand how to get around that and the tricks and stuff like that. And again, I encourage you to read uh, the documentation on that. So for me, I simply say load these things up and call me back at OGB init, which is official Google blogs init. I'm not very creative on that for respect. Once OGB init is called, um, this is the second um, revision of this function. The first revision said alert hello. I always do that just to make sure things are actually working. Um, I initialize some data. Data that you ask for and you get back and it never changes, you shouldn't ask for. So if you see a pattern in your web application where you keep asking for something and it never changes, think about maybe building it into the app and then overriding it if it changes you know, rarely. And that's what we do with init data. So we actually understand the relationship between the blogs and the tags. Now, Jocelyn, who's the lovely lady from uh, Google Corporate that actually maintains reader and stuff, she actually might change something underneath the covers. But when she does that, I can actually deal with that. Um, but I don't want to have to load all of that data in to figure out that mapping. So it's built into part of the application. I then hook the UI. Um, I'm a big performance geek, so I glue things together and I hold on to uh, divs that I know I'm going to touch a lot. So I grab them and just stick them into uh, scoped variables. And then we start the application, which is the main page, which is we boot the tag weights. So we saw that official Google blogs all. Um, I have a little function that just says URL for this label, which is that reader um, tag. Create the feed. And again, we talked about the fact that for the initial tag view, I need more information uh, from that feed, because I actually have to figure out where the entry belongs to. So when I ask for all the blogs, I get a list of 20 entries, but I need to know what that entry belongs to in terms of the blog and then the subsequent tag. And that's how I figure out the weights for the tags and how they get bolder. So I have to ask for this one in mixed format because I need to actually dip into XML land to pull that source ID out. And I have a helper function here that actually just, if you override it with a mixed format, great. Otherwise, it just uses the normal JSON format. It sets the result format. Uh, I keep saying 20. It's actually 30 entries that it actually loads in every time. And this is the same piece of code that's loaded whether or not you click on a label in the tag cloud, the hierarchical view, an individual uh, blog. So it's actually very flexible. So when Google servers actually get the top 30 entries from all the Google blogs and they ping me back, this is what they call back. And again, this is the code where we try to make a good choice of not forcing you totally out of JSON land when you want to do the XML. So if you look, I'm actually walking in JavaScript uh, notation through the entries. Um, then I have to dip into the XML node. So if you look, this e.xml node, that's present when you ask for mixed format. We automatically wrap it up. You have access to the whole document if you want, but since we know we're only looking at this element, uh, this entry, sorry, um, we actually attach it to the entry itself. So it's already scoped. And for anyone who's had to deal with XML and XPath and all those fun things, um, this seemed to be a good thing. So I have to actually dip down and get the source and the ID, and that's kind of the code that does it. Um, not very pleasant, but as pleasant as it can be since we need that data. And that data is actually buried inside of this feed. Um, and so a lot of this is normalized into JSON for you by default. But this part, this ID underneath of source with GR stream ID, blah, 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 that's what I need to figure out what blog it belonged to and then subsequently what tag. Once I get that, it's a simple waiting function of how new is the entry and how many times was an entry associated with a tag as I rip through the top 30. And that essentially generates the tag view. And then I just apply a CSS class to make it bolder or bigger or things like that. This is the code that when I actually click on those labels or on the blogs, this is actually what's happening. And this is actually 
the, almost the complete code. So when we are here, and I'm saying, you know, oh, this is an individual blog that I just you know, clicked on, or I'm in here and I'm clicking on a label, you saw the status loading. You saw loading come up. Um, I create the feed, and I tell it to load, and when it's loaded, call me back at feed loaded down here. I whip through, and now I'm going to generate some HTML. And I'm very lazy, so I don't want to have to generate HTML if I don't have to. And we thought a lot of developers, especially web developers, are the same way. So we actually package which the feed API, a feed control. And a feed control can do some high-level UI uh, controls. You can add feeds in, and it does some really neat things. One of the low-level functions it does, if you have an instance hanging around, that doesn't have any feeds associated with it, you can actually tell it to generate the HTML for an entry by hand. And so if you see feedcontrol.createHTML, that's what I'm doing there. And again, it'll generate a structure with default styling and classes that we document completely so you can override them. But instead of me doing you know, document.create or putting a string together and doing an inner HTML, I'm lazy. So I do create HTML. And then I can customize it with CSS as I feel fit. So again, the feed control generates the HTML. It changes this, you know, the standard JSON for an entry into a standard HTML node, which again, we document everything. So we do our best at picking colors and fonts and structure, um, but you're free to do whatever you want. And in this app, I actually have to do a little bit of that. So again, this is what's generated. And we, as we whip through those entries, I just append these to this view. And that's how you actually get that detailed view. That's, that's it. It's very simple. I'm not going to go over a lot of this, but essentially, this is the structure of that HTML. And this is directly from the documentation on code.google.com. So it's got what the, you know, the structure and the divs are, what the classes are. The documentation actually is online for our default styling. And then what I do here is the way CSS works, as I'm sure all of you know, is if you have a more specific rule, that will override the general rule. So we can package the CSS, deliver it to you in the feed API, allow you to do some pretty uh, nice things with very little code. But then when you need to actually style stuff, this is how you do it. So the feed content view is an instance that we set up uh, early on. And I simply make a you know, more specific rule for GS title. And I say, I need it to be orange. And I need the snippet to be light gray. Um, obviously, by default, it's Google Blue and Google Red and things like that, Google Green. The blog's view is essentially, I understand, uh, with that init data call, I understand the blogs and how they actually tie into tags. So I actually generate this structure in that init data call. And then painting it is, is fairly straightforward. And again, you saw the clicks on there. They're actually click handlers just on the hrefs that, that execute that piece of code that we talked about. It's not any harder than that. This is a, a quick view of kind of what that JSON data that I actually cache. And again, remember I said it can change. It just doesn't change very often. So instead of me keep asking for it, I actually put it inside the app. It makes it very snappy, very responsive. It's a good thing. It has things like the ID, the title, the href and it has a kind of a list of tags. The search control. All we did for the search control is we actually just put a placeholder on there. We actually have a very sophisticated search control that's you know drop it and forget it in terms of on a web page that will do everything from um, the search form, the search button, localize the correct language, results, structuring the results correctly, everything. We only needed the form part. So I only create the form part in, in this part, uh, this demo. And then I actually do the searcher on my own. But you can actually say, just give me a search control, stick it here, and away you go. It's, it's that simple. But again, because I'm lazy, instead of me starting all the way from ground one, I actually know, you know, and it's documented that the search control is made up of multiple parts. One is a search form. So I actually just say, give me a search form and blast it in here. Anytime someone types it in, call me back. And then I can execute my own searcher. So again, the top two lines are essentially uh, creating a search form and blitzing into the search view div. I then just say, hey, anybody, anytime someone types in there, just call me back at search submit. I then spin up a searcher. 
But again, that's a web search when we talk about why that is. And large results, and here's the Google custom search ID. And that's how it limits only to our blogs. The search results then come in, and we actually tie them together, similar to the way the tags in the blogs are, and generate what looks like a hierarchical view in terms of the actual uh, results themselves. OK, I was given the five minute mark, so I'm going to pick up a little bit. But this one's important, so I want to make sure that we uh, get the gist of it. So as I call out to the feed, the feed then comes back, and I have all the entries in my hand. And we saw the code where I said, OK, for each of these entries, generate the HTML using the feed control, and then just kind of slam it in to this div. There's one additional piece of code in there that happens, which is I take the snippet. Machine translation works better when there's more data. So the snippet, which is this white part, has more data than the title. So for each entry, I take the snippet and I send it back into the system, into Google servers, and I say, tell me what language this is. If it comes back and it says this language is something that's not the browser's current locale, I actually insert that T. And so if you are looking at the demo, when I click on one of these, I'll try to find one with a T real quick. That T, remember, the feed came in first. And I actually sent, as I was running, it sent it out. And then the language detection came back. And I put the T in after that callback came back. So you get a feel about how fast these services are. And this is live. There's no pre-canned data. This is, I had to plug into uh, the Ethernet. So you get a feel for how fast these things are. And so then I plug in the T when I say, you can translate this to your language. So we go original, translate it like we had seen. This is the augmented col uh, code where I said feed control create HTML and append it to uh, the feed view, which is blasting in there. And I added that detect callback function, which essentially allows me to detect what, uh, what it is. And I do a little bit of funny stuff here because I actually do a strange callback that tells me the URL. So if you flip the page real quick and for some reason we don't come back, I don't tell you can translate something because it's, the page is totally changed. And here I just say if it's not equal to the current locale, go ahead and put that in there. Translation is simply when you click on the T icon, we go ahead. And right now I actually, uh, there's a lot of better ways to do this, but I send the title and the snippet out separately and wait for them to come back. So sometimes you'll see them paint individually. And so how do we get from the application that was running into iGoogle? And this is a very simple example because we don't have a lot of custom preferences or anything like that. But it literally is about five minutes. And there's only a couple gotchas. This is an iGoogle template. I have this laying around in my home directory all the time, and I just pull it up and fill it in however. Down here, you'll see where the HTML is to be inserted. I essentially, and I'm getting older, so I use Emacs, so hopefully that doesn't dissuade anyone from listening. Um, I copy and paste it out of the application itself and put it right into this template. The only things you have to know about iGoogle is, is that iGoogle runs in a hosted environment. So your code actually isn't coming directly from your web server anymore. It's coming from iGoogle, which is actually called G modules. And there's a whole bunch of them. There's like six and 25 and blah, blah, blah. And so you can't have relative paths. And all your assets have to be totally qualified. And so originally, I had background.png. So I simply changed it to foo.com is just uh, made up. Google I.O. background.png. More advanced concepts and gadgets are you can actually ask iGoogle to cache assets like these for you. So you can actually ask for them from G modules also. So, but the first step is make sure it's all absolute. And then you can then go and optimize if your gadget is very, very popular. Uh, because the main XML, which is kind of uh, this part, always comes from iGoogle. When I actually ask for a background, it'll come from my server. So if it starts getting overloaded, you, there's ways I go will allow you to actually use their servers to cache things like that. And that's about it. General documentation, code.google.com, for uh, search fees and language. Uh, the feed control, again, is very, very helpful. Um, if you get into feeds, I would encourage you to learn that. 
the development tools, Firebug, YSlow is another good one. Um, Steve Souders, who worked at Yahoo, wrote that and now works at Google. Um, it's great for analyzing performance. And uh, one of the gentlemen that works with me on the team wrote a really, really good Firebug tutorial if you've never used it. Um, and I would definitely recommend you checking that out. And for all stuff uh, in terms of uh, code.google.com, go to that link. Uh, I believe we're really close to having everything localized into Japanese, which I think is great. And thank you. I appreciate it.